Part one of unit eight is about intermolecular forces. The main difference between the three states of matter is the distance between the particles. In gases, there's a whole lot of empty space. The particles are far apart from each other. In liquids, they're a bit closer to each other, but there's still movement allowed. And in solids, they're tightly packed with only vibrational movement. The molecules themselves can't move. Because the particles are so close to each other in liquids and solids, those are called the condensed phases. And uh, at whatever pressure and temperature you're dealing with, the state of matter of a substance is going to depend on the kinetic energy of those molecules. So the uh, lower the kinetic energy of a molecule, the more likely it's going to be a liquid or a solid. All right, let's talk about intermolecular forces. An intermolecular force is a force between different molecules. Intermolecular forces are not nearly as strong as intramolecular forces that hold compounds together. So an intramolecular force happens within a molecule, so like the covalent bond between hydrogen and chlorine. And an intermolecular force is between separate molecules, like the attraction of the chlorine on this molecule to the hydrogen on this one. The intermolecular forces are also called the van der Waals forces, and they are hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole interactions, dipole-ion interactions, and London dispersion forces. These are listed in order of decreasing strength. So hydrogen bonds are the strongest, London dispersion forces are the weakest, and we're going to talk about all of these. First one is hydrogen bonding. Hydro hydrogen bonding arises in part from the high electronegativity of nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Uh, in a hydrogen bond, a nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine exposes the nucleus of a hydrogen atom and allow that hydrogen to be attracted to the partially negative nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine of another molecule. So we uh, can only have a hydrogen bond between a hydrogen atom of one molecule and a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine of a separate molecule. So if we look at these examples over here, Hydrogen of one water molecule is going to be attracted to the oxygen of another water molecule. Or hydrogen of one ammonia could be attracted to the nitrogen of another. Or uh, hydrogen from a water to an ammonia. They don't have to be identical molecules. It just has to be a hydrogen of one molecule being attracted to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine of another molecule. The next type is dipole-dipole interactions. Molecules that are polar, that have a permanent dipole, are going to be attracted to each other. Uh, remember, in a molecule that has a dipole, one end is slightly positive and one end is slightly negative due to an uneven electron density. Well, that's going to cause those partial charges are going to be uh, attracted to each other. The positive end of one molecule is attracted to the negative end of another and the other way around. Uh, these forces are important when molecules are close to each other. So th these won't apply much in gases, but in the condensed phases like solids and liquids, dipole-dipole interactions uh, are going to matter. So if you look at this picture, the positive end of this molecule is going to be attracted to the negative end of this one, which is attracted to the positive end of another one, which is attracted to the negative end of another one. You get the idea. Opposite charges are attracted to each other, so the slightly charged ends of polar molecules will be attracted to each other as well. The more polar the molecule, the stronger that intermolecular attraction is going to be. The stronger the dipole-dipole interactions are, that's going to make the boiling point higher. So if you look at this chart here, um, you can see this measurement of the strength of the dipole is increasing as you go down the table. Well, as the dipole increases, so does the boiling point. That means that more energy is needed to overcome these dipole-dipole interactions, so the boiling point is going to be higher. The stronger dipole-dipole interactions, the more energy is needed to overcome those interactions, so the boiling point is going to have to increase. 
Next kind is ion dipole forces. These are important when we're making solutions, dissolving an ionic solid in a liquid. They're very similar to dipole-dipole forces, except instead of having two uh, polar molecules, you have a polar molecule and an ion. They work the same way, opposite charges attracting, except it's going to be a partial charge from a molecule being attracted to the charge of an ion. Uh, the strength of these forces are what makes it possible for ionic substances to dissolve in polar substance in polar solvents, excuse me. So if we think about dissolving salt in water, let's picture this ion is a sodium ion and this ion is a chloride ion. The negative end of water the oxygen end is going to be attracted to the positive sodium ion and the positive end of a water molecule the hydrogen end is going to be attracted to the negative uh, chloride ion so those opposite charges are going to attract and pull apart ionic compounds that's how they're able to dissolve in water the last type of intermolecular force is a London dispersion force London dispersion forces are attractions between an instantaneous dipole and an induced dipole. What that means is we can have two uh, just normal atoms. If we look at the example of these helium atoms right here, we know that electrons are in constant motion and sometimes those electrons are going to end up on the same side uh, of an atom. When that happens, that's going to give that side of the atom a partial negative charge. And if two atoms are close enough together, the partial negative charge on one atom can induce a partial positive charge on another. So these two electrons on helium atom 2 would push the electrons on helium atom 1 over to the left side and create an instantaneous unequal electron distribution so that the left side would be slightly negative and the right side would be slightly positive. All molecules have these forces whether they're polar or nonpolar, you just have to have electrons to have London dispersion forces. The tendency of an electron cloud to distort like this is called its polarizability. So the uh, strength of London dispersion forces is going to increase with polarizability of an atom or molecule. The shape of the molecule affects the strength of these London dispersion forces. Long skinny molecules are going to have stronger dispersion forces than short fat ones and that's just got to do with the increased uh, area of them. In a long molecule the uh, electrons can get farther to one side to create a greater instantaneous dipole than they can on a short fat molecule. And the strength of London dispersion forces tends to increase with molecular weight and the reason why is the bigger the atoms you're dealing with the more electrons you have. The more electrons you have, the more polarizable the electron cloud is going to be. So that means that the London dispersion forces are going to increase. If you look at this table right here of the halogens, we're starting at fluorine and going down that group to iodine. So we're getting more electrons as we go down this table. Molecular weight increases and so does the number of electrons. And you see that that makes the boiling point go up a whole lot. We have to use more energy to overcome the London dispersion forces that are the intermolecular attraction between those molecules. Same thing with the noble gases. Uh, as you go from helium down to xenon, from a small atom to a large atom, the number of electrons is increasing, which means that the polarizability of the atom is increasing, which is going to lead to stronger London dispersion forces. How do we know which one's going to be greater? Well, if two molecules are of comparable size and shape, dipole-dipole interactions will likely be the strongest force. That is, unless one of them has a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are always going to be the strongest in molecular force, but if uh, you're comparing two molecules and neither one has a hydrogen bond present, if they're close to the same size and shape, dipole-dipole interactions are going to be the strongest. However, if you're comparing two molecules that are different, one that's small and one that is big, has a lot of atoms in it, London dispersion forces are likely going to be the strongest in a molecular force because of the large number of electrons on that big molecule. Here is a handy flow chart to help you figure out um, what the intermolecular force you're dealing with is. So you just start at the top 
and kind of answer the yes or no questions as you get to the bottom to figure out what type of forces are present. Your question for this section, what is the strongest intermolecular force present in hydrofluoric acid?